we have Macam again, and the Doctor Vin. I think he is not able to come. I guess. So Macam will be talking about the advantages of centralized and decentralized exchanges and the roadmap to success. Over to you, Macam. Okay, thank you very much again for the kind introduction, Rajan. Uh, it's me again. Uh, thanks everyone for uh, tuning in to listen. So right now, uh, I will have to talk to myself <laughs> since the panel panel uh, panelist, Dr. Vin Menon, is not available. Uh, but uh, we are running both uh, types of exchanges, so I think I am relatively qualified to explain about uh, you know the relative advantages and disadvantages of both centralized and decentralized exchanges. So today's topic: um, centralized versus decentralized exchanges uh, roadmap to success 2021. So let me start from the journey that uh, I've seen, right? So at the start, there were only centralized finances, uh, exchanges. So the, finance, the centralized exchanges that were very popular from the early days, like Bitstamp in Europe, um, uh, there was uh, Coinbase, of course, is from the US. Uh, in China, there was Huopi and OKEX. Uh, BTCC was one of the early ones. Uh, it was sold and then after that it changed. Um, but the early witness of the early giants in this space were Huopi and OKEX. And after the Chinese government banned all the other exchanges in China, uh, there were only these two. So Huopi had a 75% market share uh, and OKEX had a 25% market share uh, when they were left as the two exchanges in October 2017. And subsequently, a lot of the Chinese exchanges fled offshore. Right? They, they all went to Hong Kong or Japan or Korea or other parts of the world, and then they sprang up again. Of course, uh, once the initial clampdown uh, ended, uh, exchanges, Chinese exchanges started to pop up again. But all of these were centralized. Um, these decentralized exchanges I, I saw in the beginning of 2018. So I think there was already some in 2017, but they were very, very early stage, very rudimentary, and the technology was quite uh, poor. So the first few projects that I saw um, around about the turn of 2017 to early 2018, um, some of them are successful. Uh, one of the first that I've seen is Kyber, fantastically successful ICO. Uh, not so successful project-wise. Uh, I don't, don't think they have done very much with the hordes of Ethereum that they harvested. I think they, they did a super successful ICO and raised 220,000 Ether. So you can imagine at $2,000 per Ether, that's that's crazy. <laughs> uh, but of course, Ether just dropped uh, to 1,006, 1,007 right now. But anyway, back then, it was not so much. Uh, back then in September, uh, August to September. I remember I was online when the ICO happened and fantastic. Very In a very, very short period of time, they raised uh, their hard cap. And at that time, Ether was about $200. So you can well imagine, right? It's gone 10x. Uh, and they raised a fantastic amount of, of uh, tokens of Ethereum. But uh, being a decentralized uh, exchange, I didn't really see very much on the roadmap. Uh, today, it is live. Uh, Kyber, unfortunately, has a bit of a minor bad press recently uh, from one of the uh, wrong oracles or information that they pulled. Uh, I think that caused a bit of loss. But other than that, I, I think I've, I met the team. They are doing OK. Uh, so I think that was one of the very first decentralized uh, exchanges that I met. I met another one called Sparrow. Uh, both were funded by the same or sponsored by the same VC group uh, in Singapore. And the Sparrow boss was also very young. Um, and Sparrow, I think, did very well last year. Uh, they they re reinvented themselves and moved into uh, derivatives. And I think that, that really took, took off. Uh, but back then, early 2018, when they were trying to be a decentralized uh, exchange, uh, it didn't really do very well. <clears throat> I've met a lot of decentralized exchanges along the journey, my journey as well, uh, and some of them were trying to call themselves hybrid exchanges. Um, and to my knowledge, uh, I think these were the two most successful early stage um, decentralized exchanges that I know of. And of course, uh, Uniswap was also born um, around 2018, and today is super successful, right? It's one of the top uh, 
uh, decentralized exchanges in the market. But for the longest time, from 2018 to early 20 to mid 2020, uh, there wasn't so much utility there. Uh, it was known as a default place where you could just launch a project easily, uh, create a liquidity pool, and do that. But here I start talking about the pros and cons uh, because uh, one of the projects that we advised is called KingSwap, right? KingSwap, K I N G S W A P. And that launched on Halloween uh, last year, 31st October 2020. And the first launch was on a liquidity pool that was created on Uniswap. So the advantage, uh, very cheap, easy to list, uh, just create the, the pair um, and then put in the liquidity and voila, right, you have your pool. The disadvantage when we were migrating the tokens uh, from the liquidity pool to the new uh, KingSwap decentralized exchange, <clears throat> it simply couldn't be done. There's no customer support, nobody at Uniswap to turn to, no central controls whatsoever. It's basically left as a, as a more or less like an SDK created by developers left there for you to play around with. No one can help you or intervene if something goes wrong. So that's the unfortunate uh, problem with decentralized exchanges. Uh, the users are left to their own devices. Very few of these decentralized exchanges even have uh, known faces or customer support. And the, if you have a problem, if something got hacked, something went there, that's it. You are not going to be able to get any kind of support or assistance. Simply because of the model uh, that these decentralized exchanges uh, work with, um, <clears throat> there are two types, two main types of decentralized exchanges. <clears throat> there are those that use liquidity pools, uh, which are popularized by Uniswap. Um, then there are those that are order book style, uh, which are more like Kyber. Uh, then there were some other exchanges that even aggregated. So if you were participating in decentralized exchanges in the early days, uh, you will know that there's very thin liquidity. Uh, there's Basically, if you want to fulfill an order, you can place an order and you can even wait for days and nobody takes up that order and fulfills it because there's no central liquidity pool to, to fulfill your order from. Uh, so the Uniswap model of creating liquidity pairs was fantastic. Very great innovation, uh, something I really, really admired uh, from a technological and business perspective. Uh, very well done, but uh, it still has drawbacks. And decentralized exchanges are held hostage by mainnet costs. So when we launched uh, KingSwap, it was on the Ethereum mainnet. And as you know, Ethereum gas fees are crazy, crazy high. It can be like 100 GUI, 200 GUI, you know. Some days, a normal transaction, like one and a half years ago, that cost me 10 cents, could cost something like $100. It's just simply unimaginable, right? <clears throat> so, so this is a um, disadvantage of a decentralized exchange. Um, advantages and dis disadvantages of centralized exchanges. So centralized exchanges were the default um, and initial uh, kinds of uh, exchange platforms that existed. The, the advantages, firstly, there's a liquidity pool. So order fulfillment is much faster because it's all by order book matching. Uh, and more often than not, the successful and competent exchanges would know how to link liquidity providers. So even if there's not much liquidity within their ecosystem, as long as they can buy liquidity or, uh, or pull liquidity from other providers, then they are able to fulfill the and match the order books as well. Uh, centralized exchanges are much faster, much cheaper, uh, because they only charge uh, usually a small fraction uh, for admin fees anywhere from even negative, some of the exchanges doing promotions actually pay you to make uh, contracts, right? Trading contracts. Um, and it can go up to maybe 1%. I've seen 1% as the most expensive. Uh, I, I personally use Gemini and unfortunately the exchange uses, charges the most, right? 1% to buy, 1% to sell, 1% to withdraw your funds. Crazy expensive. Uh, Binance uh, only charges 0.1%, right? And some uh, withdrawal fees, so much cheaper. So advantages of centralized exchanges, I would say they are better than decentralized exchanges that use the liquidity pool method because the gas fees on the main Ethereum mainnet now are just too high. So you cannot really do many types of trades or many uh, frequent trades unless you are whale, you are trading 
huge amounts. And increasingly, you will see a lot of people complaining that the decentralized finance space is really a playground for the whales. The whales are the ones who are, who are big, big investors, not the small common men on the ground. Uh, take for example, um, if you transfer $1 million worth of ETH and you transfer $100 worth of ETH, it's still the same gas fee, right? It doesn't change based on the amount of uh, transactions that you do, uh, the value of the transactions you do. So someone who has a big pocket, a deep pocket, who's trading a million dollars worth of uh, ETH will only have a small fraction because $100 over 1 million is a very, very small fraction. But if you are only trading $100 and it costs you $100 to do it, you know, that's crazy. You have a 100% cost uh, of the transaction. Uh, of, so there's no point, right? So for the, the current decentralized finance space, uh, is being destroyed by the gas fees, the transaction fees that are generated by, I, I think there are a lot of exchanges that are profiteering. They have, I've seen some complaints from about SushiSwap, Uniswap that are saying people are, uh, the big whales who are playing on this are simply churning their transactions in order to make more transaction fees, in order to make more of the native tokens, right? Which is a self-fulfilling for prophecy for themselves. But this prices out all the common men, uh, all the small retail investors. <clears throat> so DeFi, um, DeFi, I think, has a great value. Um, it's here to stay. And as long as we can solve the gas fees, a transaction fee problem, uh, I think it will only grow from strength to strength. So at KingSwap, actually, we recognize this from day one, and we put into a roadmap a very early migration to layer two. And I'm happy to say that we have just done that. Right. We just deployed the contract over the weekend, tested it. Tomorrow, uh, the decentralized exchange will be fully on the on the DAI network. So we'll be using Replica X DAIs to represent all the tokens on the ecosystem. And layer 2 will be successfully implemented. And this will reduce the gas fees by 10 to 100 times. And I think this will uh, really help the community tremendously because suddenly they will be able to do the trades uh, that they were priced out of doing earlier. So I think this is a uh, advantage of centralized exchanges over decentralized exchanges, uh, simply that there is no additional cost other than the fixed admin fees that the exchange wants to charge you. Decentralized exchanges have to use whatever network they are using because it's basically pooling um, and swapping assets between peer-to-peer -peer wallets. So if the network gets clogged, you know, that's too bad. Your cost of the transaction gets too high. And with the advent of the Aave flash loans and a whole host of uh, other copies of Aave, uh, flash loans became super popular. So people who are trying to do a series of transactions within one block simply just pay through the nose in order to move it. Right. So I've, I've read of stories uh, of uh, successful traders hacking or rather doing flash loan attacks on networks and moving and running off with like millions of dollars of assets, uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars of assets. Um, how does a flash loan execute? Uh, you simply line up uh, at least three swaps. So from one stable coin swapping to another stable coin, another swap, another stable coin swapping to another, and then the third one swapping back to the first one. So for example, USDT, if you see a price differential between USDT, let's say one is tra trading 99 cents and then DAI is trading 1.01, that's a spread. And then you can do a, a flash loan, which loans uh, this amount and then uh, use a leverage um, method to multiply it many, many times. And then let's say you trade your 1.01 .01 to another token, which is like 0 0.98. So you make another difference. And then from the 0 0.98, you swap it back to your 0 0.99. So you have made uh, a fair amount of spread in between. Of course, these opportunities don't exist all the time. So a lot of these flash loan protocols are simply looking for arbitrage opportunities. Uh, I've personally seen it as well on our Kingsoft project. We see the uh, flash loan bots uh, hitting the pool every time that there's a big jump or change uh, in prices between exchanges. So the good and bad of decentralized exchanges using liquidity pool methodology is that the uh, automated bots, the automated market makers that you see on the, the uh, all over the platforms right now, are uh, actually helping to arbitrage and to reduce, uh, thin out the spread between the exchanges. So that's kind of a good thing. But uh, those creators of protocols and platforms who didn't really cater for such attacks um, from the bots would 
suffer loss, right? They will suffer a liquidity loss uh, due to these uh, sudden attacks. <clears throat> so that's a vulnerability of the centralized exchanges. <clears throat> centralized exchanges, there's a huge, huge vulnerability, which is hacking, right? So a lot of uh, top exchanges got hacked and that brought them down, right? So uh, you would see the uh, Mt. Gox case, which was the most famous early stage um, a fall of a major exchange. I think at that time they were the biggest exchange, uh, centralized exchange in the world. And then one day the founder just said, oh, we got hacked and suddenly everything was stopped. <clears throat> so some think that he stole it himself and then just declared it. Uh, something, you know, he is telling a truth and he got hacked. Uh, there was another um, infamous case where a Canadian exchange, top exchange, um, suddenly went bust, uh, lost millions of dollars because the founder uh, was proclaimed to be dead, right? So he was the only one with private keys. He went somewhere to India for a holiday or something and then pronounced dead, uh, disappeared <clears throat> or died. So a big problem with centralized exchanges is that there's a central control. <clears throat> it's the same as if you have a bank or financial institute and you have a vault. So if someone, if some robbers manage to attack your vault, they make off with all the money and then you're you're done. <clears throat> so that's a, a big vulnerability of centralized exchanges. Um, and that's something that hasn't been, been solved because there's practically no uh, system that is totally foolproof and that can prevent people from attacking. Um, and many of the hacks that you've seen over the years have actually happened from uh, the, an inside job. So inside of the house attacks are the worst, uh, most common and they actually um, have caused uh, many of these centralized exchange hacks. I also personally know um, an exchange boss. Uh, he, I, he invited me to go over to Kuala Lumpur, meet up with him, you know, catch up on things, and we had several business ventures going. And then that night, he was in a fluster. So he invited us for dinner, we met up at the pub and had dinner and drinks. And he was constantly on his phone and looking very worried. <clears throat> and I asked him what happened. And then while he was on the phone, I was getting messages from his LinkedIn and from his, uh, from his Telegram saying hi. So, and then it was like very unusual messages. So, so the hacker basically took over his phone, got access to all his passwords, all his accounts, and then replicated it. So I had this guy talking to me with his real account and another account that, was, that looked exactly the same talking to me as well. So, you know, that's very unfortunate. That night he lost like 200 wallets, right? It's, it's crazy. So you have to make a police report and let the police try to deal with it. So that's a big problem or big vulnerability of centralized exchanges. Now, decentralized exchanges don't face this problem because uh, they do not have a central pool of funds. They basically utilize a smart contract that connects wallets peer to peer uh, or the wallets of the users and investors directly with the decentralized exchange. And this shows, uh, you know, the, the likelihood of being hacked is much, much less because just like bees are drawn to honey, right? So bees are drawn to pollen and then they create, they pull it off to the hive and make honey. So the, it's the same thing. If there is a known address, like let's say Binance is, is, claiming that it's doing billions and billions of dollars every day. So all hackers will just target it and attack it, right? So they'll do denial of service attacks. They'll do um, all sorts of, uh, of, of attempts. And I've also met a lot of security experts. Um, like I, I, I know like John from uh, Sentinel Protocol, he was saying that uh, this that, is actually a, a ICO that uh, was trying to do security. And he was saying that they developed their own proprietary system and while they were doing the ICO, they could see live attacks. <laughs> so they had the war room kind of uh, screen and they could see attacks from all over the world coming in from hackers trying to get hold of their tokens. So, I mean, that's, that's uh, true, true story, but, uh, you know, funny at the same time, right? It's just like what you see in the movies, like hackers attacking uh, a place with the resources. So this is something that a lot of um, centralized exchange bosses who are uninitiated, a lot of them are new entrepreneurs, young businessmen who think that they can uh, do well by creating a centralized uh, exchange, and then they get hacked, right? And then very few fail-safe fail methods, very little insurance, very little uh, security for these lost assets. 
at best, maybe you can get the big boys to assist if the stolen uh, assets go into the big exchanges like Hopi or Coinbase or Binance. You can get them to do customer support and actually they have helped uh, to stop a lot of these thefts and uh, assets from being frittered away. Like for example, <clears throat> the New Zealand pro uh, project that got that got hacked, lost um, the New Zealand exchange, I think it's called Crypto, yeah? and Cryptopia or something like that. Um, they, they lost millions of dollars and the, the funds were um, moved to Binance, which then stopped them, right? I think, but that was only a part of it. And recently I read that the uh, perpetrators of the coin check heist uh, that took $530 million worth of NEM uh, back in May 2018 uh, have been apprehended. So there were some Russian uh, hackers involved and they were traced as well because some of the assets ended up in centralized exchanges. So it is possible for centralized exchanges to assist in this as long as you can trace because all these wallet addresses are public domain. So these are some of the advantages and disadvantages. Now, of course, a lot of you are wondering, you know, if you are a founder, should you go on a decentralized exchange? Should you go on a centralized exchange? So this is something that we actually have um, as a query from a lot of, um, of founders, a lot of clients as well. So unfortunately, my answer is always it depends, right? It depends on what you want to achieve, depends on your demographic, who you are trying to reach out to. For example, <clears throat> if you are reaching out to American investors, then I would say the regulated compliant way of doing things Go get a Reg D or Reg A, Reg S um, offering done properly out of the US and then get a US exchange that has these kinds of coverage and has a bit, uh, bit license to, to list your project so that you are doing it legitimately. If you don't do that and you have American investors, you could uh, get your project in trouble or you could get the exchange in trouble. Right? Look at the uh, BitMEX. BitMEX was doing so well as a derivatives market, just trading Bitcoin. And unfortunately, they were not fully compliant with the US laws. Um, and then the US government claimed that there were significant numbers of US investors or uh, traders who used the platform. And they were very lax on the K KYC and AML uh, requirements. So they basically, the, the founders uh, were incarcerated or uh, have arrest warrants out for them and have subpoenas out and uh, cases lodged against them right so so if like i said if you're going for american investors try to be compliant otherwise just forbid any american investors from coming in if you want to uh, if you don't want to get regulated up but you still want to have american investors then make sure that they are only compliant accredited investors Right. So if they are high net worths and they check the boxes and they give you the declarations that they are high net worth, you'll probably fall under some of the exclusions and exemptions in your home jurisdiction or whichever jurisdiction the exchange is operating out of. <clears throat> so if you are not dealing with the Americans, then your life will be much easier. Right. So for the rest of the world, um, except for certain countries which ban cryptocurrency, like for example, China is still under ban. Um, Korea, sometimes it's a ban, sometimes it's not. It really depends on which authorities you talk to. Uh, uh, countries like like uh, Nigeria is now banning cryptocurrencies. <clears throat> Russia sometimes bans, sometimes doesn't. So it really depends, right? So every country has its own laws. Uh, but other than uh, the, the US citizens, uh, most other investors can be blocked by IP and the regulators usually won't be so harsh on you, right? So uh, project owners who are trying to consider launching, uh, if you are doing it, whether it's a DEX or a SEX, right? A centralized exchange or a decentralized exchange, eventually uh, the regulators still have the long arm of the law and still can reach out to you. So if you want to be really safe, then make sure that you are regulated and compliant. Of course, if you're running decentralized finance uh, projects and you have a, a DAO, a, a decentralized uh, autonomous organization with no real uh, management and governance model, uh, which are pointing to a few members, <clears throat> then it may be easier to have something that is basically on the cloud and distributed all over the world, right? Decentralized networks. Um, in such cases, then you may not need to worry about uh, about the regulations so much. So in such cases, uh, DEXs might be a better idea. 
and especially since DEXs are uh, basically peer-to-peer. -peer. So the project really doesn't take much uh, part unless it pre mine the tokens and sell it, in which case they are a token issuer and they can be uh, covered under the laws. But if you allow people to just mine the tokens and create it themselves and then uh, farm it themselves and sell it themselves or swap with others, <clears throat> then it's very unlikely that the project will have any kinds of uh, ramifications or issues. So coming back to the initial question again, uh, should you choose a sex, should you choose a dex? Okay. So using our own example, KingSwap again, it's a very good analogy because it's a recent project and we actually did all, all of these. And so I can share with you some of the uh, pros and cons. We did three centralized exchange listings and one decentralized, two decentralized exchange listings. So earlier I mentioned we started with Uniswap um, on Halloween's day. And then one week later, we migrated to our own uh, KingSwap DEX. And the, the own control of KingSwap DEX was much better. Of course, since we are controlling it, uh, we could uh, manage things much, much better than using Uniswap. The pro of uni using Uniswap, good to go. You start and deploy a couple of hours, you are up and running. Um, no cost other than the cost for the deployment of the smart contract in the factory um, and the and the tokens. Um, you have access to the community who likes Uniswap, uh, the decentralized community. Uh, you have access to investors and token buyers who don't want to be uh, providing their KYC and their customer details, and they just plug in anonymously through their own wallets. So these are the advantages of uh, decentralized exchange listing. When we did our own decentralized exchange listing, of course, that was better. Uh, we had full control over that, uh, and we could also promote our own project. So that was nice. Then we also did centralized exchange listings. So I mentioned the pros of the uh, DEXs. The cons of the DEXs uh, would be that there is no fixed community uh, that is engaged unless you create it. So for KingSwap, we had to then uh, engage with community management, uh, bring in hypers, bring in influencers to let the world know about the project. And we grew from zero to current, I think, 37 or 38,000 Telegram followers, a uh, very supportive community. So this is something that a project has to build. And with the community members, then the project will really be live. Um, <clears throat> so that was a disadvantage in terms of marketing and outreach. And people with uh, who are starting scratch, of course, they don't have any uh, tokens of yours, uh, except their own tokens in their own uh, MetaMask uh, or Wallet Connect or Trust Wallet kind of, of wallets. Now, centralized exchanges, we did three in January. <clears throat> so we did a listing on Bitmart, uh, very good, uh, excellent support. I know one of the management and we had very great support from them. Uh, and in fact, I think we have done the most sales on um, and the community really likes the support there on Bitmart. Uh, volume there is also uh, good. Secondly, we listed one week later um, on Hotbit. So uh, Hotbit has a de different demographic from Bitmart um, and the community there was also quite engaged. The AMA was amazing. After the uh, thing, one hour AMA, we were bombarded with a thousand questions <laughs> within a few minutes. That was crazy. Um, <clears throat> so it was a very engaged community. Uh, a lot of the community were actually from Southeast Asia. Uh, Bitmart has a more uh, Chinese and Hong Kong and US uh, presence. Then uh, the third centralized exchange that we listed on is a New Zealand, uh, a New Zealand exchange called Coinbase. Uh, so these three centralized exchanges, we had good experiences working with the listing managers uh, who invited us to launch on the exchanges. And uh, I would say that it's pretty good service and uh, pretty responsive customer support. Uh, the unfortunate thing is that um, the sometimes don't entertain all the projects, uh, sorry, all the investors who do something wrong, right? So that really depends on the user, the individual user who has an account on these exchanges and the exchange itself. That's something that the project cannot help with. <clears throat> um, so centralized exchanges, um, another big advantage that is uh, not often spelled out is that 
if you are on two or more recognized exchanges, centralized exchanges, then sites like uh, CoinMarketCap, like, um, like Etherscan, like uh, CoinGecko will pull your data from these exchanges that are already listed and then your coin will be recognized on these listing sites, which is fantastic, right? So that's something which is a nice, very nice side effect of uh, listing on centralized exchanges. If you are listing on an unknown new decentralized exchange, or if you are uh, running your own decentralized exchange, um, then of course, all these listing sites don't even know who you are and they will not pull any data. And then very few people from the community will know who you are. So centralized exchanges will be cheaper to market out of, uh, to do PR for, and they already have their own community groups, uh, which can be market to, marketed to. Whereas decentralized exchanges are basically free for all, right? It's out there, uh, much harder to garner a centralized uh, place where you can reach out to all the community yourself, unless you're running your own project, like I mentioned. So these are some of the uh, follow on advantages and disadvantages of the centralized exchange versus decentralized exchange. Now, one more big uh, drawback to centralized exchanges other than the top few, I would say maybe top five, top 10, I would say most of the other exchanges uh, don't have very significant uh, liquidity for the smaller coins. The Most of the liquidity is only for uh, Ethereum, Bitcoin, etc. So uh, very little, uh, very thin liquidity is provided for altcoins generally, other than the top few exchanges. So if you are trying to get real volume, real liquidity, uh, it's quite hard to find them on the smaller centralized exchanges. Take for example, um, <clears throat> centralized exchanges back in 2018, when you know it was all the rage and it was one of the first, uh, I would say the second use case uh, of uh, cryptocurrencies that were popular. Uh, first one of course being protocols. So I personally knew dozens of exchanges in Singapore, right? And I met like, exchange gatherings of all the exchange bosses is like crazy and i would say there were at least a few hundred few hundred chinese exchanges in singapore uh, they had a team in beijing or shanghai and uh, then another team overseas which was usually located in singapore and i would say at that time the number of exchanges was easily two to three thousand uh, by my own estimates and that was 2018 there simply wasn't enough uh, of a uh, market, uh, cryptocurrency market capitalization and actual usage of the cryptocurrencies daily other than trading. And for that number of exchanges, um, most of the smaller ones simply um, went off, right? They either got hacked or didn't make enough money and or couldn't get enough funding to grow. And a lot of them fell by the wayside. <clears throat> So centralized exchanges, uh, something that you uh, uh, you need to look out for also is the uh, volume that they declare. Uh, some of it is uh, not real, right? A lot of it could be market made, uh, could be wash trading. So that's something that you should always look out for. Uh, so that's a major drawback of the centralized exchanges. Decentralized exchanges hardly ever have any wash trading unless they also engage market, trade, market makers to buy and sell their own coin. Um, because it's much more difficult to uh, do such activities on decentralized exchanges because every every transaction basically costs gas fees. All right, so it goes to the Ethereum network uh, or the DOT network, etc. But uh, centralized exchanges is under central control, so a lot of things can be done by uh, their central admin. So that's another, uh, I would say, advantage, disadvantage relative uh, between centralized and decentralized exchanges. So answering the first question again, uh, because I was rambling on because there are a lot of consideration as, and factors uh, that go into your choice between decentralized and centralized. I would say the final winners will be something like a hybrid model. Uh, and that's something we are building at KingSwap. Uh, we already started off with a decentralized model and we are also adding functionality and bridges to centralized models. And uh, it's basically, uh, something for everyone, right? There will be some who don't really need the ideals of decentralization and peer-to-peer -peer transactions and prefer the convenience and speed of uh, a central liquidity pool. 
there will always be those who prefer to do decentralized um, transactions because of the ideals uh, of uh, Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies in general, or uh, decentralization. Um, then there will be more costs if you want to list on the popular um, centralized exchanges. Decentralized exchanges usually don't have any cost at all other than the deployment of the smart contract and sometimes of your uh, network and your uh, factory to produce the, the smart contract. Um, <clears throat> like I mentioned earlier, marketing, PR, communications, outreach uh, is much stronger for centralized exchanges because uh, they have a staff of uh, workers and operators uh, who specialize in these. Um, Something that you have to look out for as well is hacking on centralized exchanges. So don't be surprised if you use a, a centralized exchange and uh, all your funds are gone, right? Uh, that happens very often. Um, I wouldn't say the majority of, uh, of cryptocurrency exchanges get hacked, but a fair number of them do. And um, if they don't have enough funds to cover the losses, then it will be a very bad state. You know, they look at Mount Gox. They had, um, they had so many investors or traders who had coins stuck there and had sued the government, sued the project, uh, and are still litigating years after, right? So that's something to watch out for. So this, I would say, would be some of the considerations that all of you can consider uh, in the relative composition between uh, centralized and decentralized exchanges. So what to answer the final part of this topic, uh, Roadmap to Success 2021. I would say that the exchanges are doing very well right now. Central, the top centralized exchanges are doing very well because uh, market fever has come back. Uh, so many people are putting money into the cryptocurrency space. Uh, a lot of coins have risen multiple times uh, this year and uh, late last year. Altcoin season has come back already, so happy hunting. Uh, a lot of the top uh, altcoins that have achieved capability uh, after incubating themselves for the last two to three years uh, are now showing utility, and a lot of these are being supported right now. <clears throat> so a lot of these altcoins are rising very rapidly. Uh, a lot of um, picks and shovels business, like Chainlink came out of nowhere. Once they were adopted by China and named as an uh, oracle, uh, meaning a database for information. They were suddenly used by a lot of uh, different projects and their prices went up. Uh, by all, by all, any right-minded uh, business calculation of valuation and relative value of the project, Chainlink is not nowhere near worth what is, is on the market cap right now. <clears throat> but simply because it's one of those rare cryptocurrency uh, projects that uh, had functionality, so it, it went up, right? Uh, so roadmap to success, uh, I think that every founder or person trying to consider using centralized and decentralized exchanges should probably adopt both. I'm going to sit on the fence and say there are certain use cases which are better using DEXs, there are certain ones that are better using SEXs, and there will probably be a winner in the future that is using a HiFi model, uh, which is a hybrid model. So there will be some functionality that will be peer-to-peer -peer and decentralized, some functionality that will be centralized and using liquidity pools and liquidity providers, and that will probably be a winning model. Uh, to me. And a lot of the exchanges, uh, whether decentralized exchange or centralized exchange that have their own native tokens, would probably do better. Uh, as you can see from the Binance uh, BNB coin, it has done fantastically well since it started. Um, and I think now it's what, uh, over $200. It started at, I think, 10 cents or less, um, depending on which stage you bought it at. So it's gone up many, many times already. So I would say uh, some popular exchanges that have this kind of model uh, that combine both advantages, uh, that, that combine the advantages of centralized exchanges and decentralized exchanges and can eliminate the weaknesses uh, will do very well. All right. So with that, I will leave you um, and that will be the end of my uh, thoughts on this topic. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Malcolm.
Welcome. That was excellent insight on the exchanges. I want to ask you certain questions. Uh, sure. See how do you, how do the centralized Of course, a third way is that if they take certain positions and they actually trade themselves, they will also be able to make money from uh, capital gains. So listing fees have come down so much from the start, but um, there are always new projects. And uh, I think they are doing better by streamlining the services and being more capable in terms of the operational uh, capability. So the popular centralized exchanges are still surviving. I can see that the consolidation is happening um, and fewer and fewer of them will be able to compete. Even, eventually, there will be a few main ones uh, that are centralized. Uh, These uh, centralized exchanges are you know, um, launching all ETP, ETF products you know, to attract institutional investors. So that's right. a big market, I guess. What do you see? What's your view on that? Yeah, I think a lot of these are actually not very legal. <laughs> so, like exactly like what happened to Bitmax, you know, eventually when the long arm of the law comes after them, especially the US law makers, uh, they, a lot of them will feel the heat. So, um, yes, they are trying to reinvent themselves. So, exchanges, um, centralized exchanges have morphed over the years as well. So from 2018, when they were just purely allowing trading, uh, then later on leverage trading, 100x, 150x. I, I know the some of the founders or management team at Coinflex. Uh, Bitmax was offering 100x leverage. Uh, Coinflex offered 150x. You know, it's basically an online casino, right? And the casino gaming uh, element, of course, is tuned up by allowing derivative products, by allowing ETFs, CFDs, and all sorts of uh, futures and whatever derivatives you can come up with, because that's what's making money the most for the trading platforms. Spot trading doesn't make so much money. Uh, derivatives trading makes much, much more money for the platform operators. So another uh, thing that they came up with was the launch pads and IEOs. So IEOs were um, already around from early stages, but uh, Binance popularized it in early uh, 2019. And for about eight to 10 months, it became very, very popular. Right, so exchanges are always innovating as well. If they see a, a revenue crunch, they will come up with uh, new innovative methods to make money. Even uh, they are also venturing into DeFi protocols. Yes, to capture the biggest market. Yes, that's right. Uh, many exchanges, centralized exchanges, created a, a DeFi DEX uh, index, and some of them also offer DeFi products. And they, a lot of them offer. Um, returns on investments as well, uh, similarly to DeFi. Thank you, Michael. Uh, You're welcome. Uh, thank you, and uh, look forward in the future, and we'll start the next session. Thank okay. you very much. Cheers. Bye-bye.